The oceans are life, our life, and 95% of them remain unknown. It's time we explored our last great frontier, the heart of our planet. To discover the secrets of the deep before the ocean's demise triggers our own. For many centuries, the ocean has been very, very close. Basically, it has been part of our own uh, DNA, I would say. It is our livelihood. As Seychelles, we depend on our ocean, whether that's for tourism or fisheries. The bounties that our ocean gives to us enables our economy to flourish. We have a huge EZ of 1.3 million square kilometers. For the last six years, we've been undertaking a major exercise that is drafting our marine spatial plan. For us to do a decision making and, and properly plan for protection, we need data and information. There was basically nothing in regards to data related to the deeper ocean. really don't have almost any information for everything that is below 30 meters. So the main aim is to have this baseline information that would allow us to understand what's going on in the deeper environments in the whole of the Seychelles. We want to know about the identity of species, what kind of species do we have there, how common are they, uh, where do they occur. Only if you have that information can you then start making some decisions about what conserve the Seychelles government really want to get that baseline information of their deeper habitats so they can make more informed decisions for the marine spatial planning. SACAT is a conservation financing body and we are currently managing the proceeds of two innovative financing sources. One is the Debt for Nature swap, two is the Seychelles Sovereign Blue Bond and together with those two instruments we are able to manage 700,000 US dollars every year. With these proceeds we are able to fund projects linked to marine conservation, climate adaptation and the blue economy. So one of the very interesting initiatives that we, we took was a creative collaboration with the Necton mission. And this is where we were able to bring our funds together to be able to fund six Seychelles participants and their research projects on the Necton mission. We had quite a big group on board that were Seychelles. All the Seychelles based scientists had a project on board, whether that was collecting zooplankton samples, which are little organisms that live in the top surface of the ocean, or whether that was looking at predator abundance uh, throughout the Seychelles Islands. Other tasks involved collecting biological samples throughout our EEZ. My particular project, together with many other Seychellois that were on board, was looking at the little baby fish and baby eggs that we could find within our water column. Hello everybody, I'm going in the sub in about 15 to 20 minutes, so I want to say happy Women's Day to everybody. When I went down the first time, I was scared. I didn't know what to expect. It was at 250, so you can imagine it was pitch dark down there. The corals were so tiny, and like you can imagine the currents also. My research project is about the viability in the trophic signatures and 
the food web dynamics within the Seychelles waters. At 100 or 150, you could see like fans, sea fans, fish, tuna, travelers going around like small fishes. Good copy. Where did I have inventing now? There, there we go. I think one of the highlights was to see the change. You know, as you go from zero, there's a lot of light on the corals. And as you go further down to 300 meters, the light dissipates. It seems like life itself slows down as you go further down into the sea. The submersibles that we had and a little robot called an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle, allowed us to collect samples at different depths. In total, we collected about 1,200 biological samples, including the zooplankton, sea stars, and corals. So that will enhance our understanding of what we can find within our own waters. Eighteen thousand years ago, at the last glacial maxima, the water line was 120 meters lower than it is today. So there's a lot more land exposed, and that water level and the plateau that we see now at depth is that wave action on the coastline. We did see rich coral gardens made of different sort of whip-like corals as well as different sea ferns, different morphologies of sponges that we didn't see at the previous depths, shallower, and we also didn't see them deeper. So there were distinct communities present at those depths. A lot of the shallow reefs that were close to the sea surface, they couldn't keep up with sea levels rising and they ended up being several decades of meters below the sea surface and some of them eventually gave rise to mesophotic coral ecosystems that we see today. As we move down through the shallow photic area where there's lots of light, then into the mesophotic with a little bit of light, and then kind of down into a part of the ocean which we call the rarephotic, where there's very little amounts of natural light. So the rarephotic zone was first described in Curaçao and the Caribbean. Even though you see the same genera and the same families of fish or corals, they're not necessarily the same species. They're something like the deeper water cousins of what you see in the mesophotic and shallow reefs. The reason why you see distinct communities in the rarephotic zone is because you have different conditions to what you have in the shallower depths. And because of that, you have different species adapting to those conditions that cannot otherwise survive in the shallower depths and vice versa. relatively recent that we've started to explore kind of what I would call the, this middle zone. So scuba divers and snorkelers can look at the very top of the surface and then as deep sea biologists we'd look at the very deep areas down sort of a thousand meters but this bit in the middle that joins them up has not really been explored. So using the submersibles um, and some of the other technologies that allow us to spend a lot of time down in this depth zone has really enabled us to understand sort of where the bands start, what's different about them, what organisms are living at different depths and we're actually being able to now separate this area from about 30 meters down to about 300. It might not be necessarily as abundant in life as you go down but you do see different organisms and of course Every organism is usually providing different ecosystem services, uh, so we do actually need all of them in order to have a functioning ocean. Aldabra is a special place because it seems like there's lots of predators. Um, in water just 30 centimeters deep, you can see black tip reef sharks and lemon sharks, which is really amazing. Um, there's lots of turtles and tortoises. The 
the life around Aldabra is really abundant and it really highlights the fact that protection works because Aldabra has been protected for over 40 years and it's just amazing to see the hard work that's gone into ensuring that Aldabra stays as pristine as possible. stove was truly an enlightenment. Seeing the coral on our stove really got a lot of us emotional. I've never seen as many unaffected coral before, so really, yeah. Because it looked like it was in an extremely healthy state, unlike what you sometimes see around Mahe or the Inner Island group. So a lot of us seeing our stove from zero to 300 meters got us in tears uh, because of just the, the vibrant life that we've, we found on the corals around our stove. We did see the most healthy looking coral reef ecosystems that we saw throughout the whole of the expedition and they were teeming with a lot of life. Why was it amazing? Um, well, I saw so much diversity of corals and that continued not just in the shallow water, but as we came down through depths. Why we like diversity as biologists is generally diversity means that we've got a healthy, functioning ecosystem. So it was really great to see. One of the exercises we're trying to do now with our Seychelles partners is trying to identify the reasons why reefs in the stove are so healthy. There are several reasons behind this, we think. If you have very steep topography in some locations, which we did see in a stove, you might have uh, stronger currents. Now these stronger currents coming from the deep, they might carry food with them, which might favor coral growth as well as large fish communities. Upwellings is cold water coming from the depths of the ocean up, and this keeps those surface waters just a little bit cooler. And this is vital as we go through climate change and we're seeing those surface waters getting much warmer. If you've got that cold water coming up, then it really mitigates some of those surface temperatures. So the future hypothesis essentially states that if you have healthy reefs and in a good condition between 30 and 60 meters, there is a high likelihood that they will have some overlap in their communities. And what that means is that if you have shallow water disturbance, be from overfishing or other climate change impacts, then some of these deeper organisms can repopulate the shallows. I joined the Nectana expedition in order to look at the marine plants. So I w I'm mostly interested in seagrasses, but also in, uh, in the algae. When I started working on the, on the boat, I realized just how widespread and important seagrass are at all different levels of ecosystem. So seagrass meadows are very important. They're very important for sea turtles, for both green turtles and hawksbills. Green turtles especially, because that's what the green turtles eat but they're also very important for commercial fisheries and just generally for biodiversity. When you looked at the photos taken by the submarines, almost every single frame had dead seagrass leaves in it and all the way down to you know, 400 meters depth. It's bringing nutrients down into the deep sea and providing nutrition for animals that don't get access to much nutrition because there's not much sunlight coming through and so you, know, you don't have a lot of photosynthesis going on. We know that seagrass is what they call a blue carbon sink. It brings the carbon, the organic carbon, into its tissues and it stores carbon in its, in its rhizomes and roots. the AFOX Visiting Fellows Program for four weeks. I'm trying to investigate or describe the marine predator community. Marine predators are sharks and large groupers around Aldabra, from the shallows to the deep sea. The ultimate goal of conservation research is to protect the natural world. So um, uh, that is what I want to try, to also help to achieve and sharing that work with as many people as possible, so empowering them to want the same. 
This was an incredible and very important expedition for Seychelles to help with vital data in policy making, decision making, fitting into the Marine Spatial Plan. But also importantly, it's not all about conservation, but it's also about usage of marine resources, sustainable use of marine resources such as fisheries. It was a perfect timing to gather this data to find out what was, what was there and eventually use the discovery, the information that was gathered to decide and confirm on the different zones that we put in place that eventually led to the 30% uh, protection of our EZ. Now that we have achieved 30% marine protected areas, SACAT is very much focused on ensuring that these areas are effectively managed. So we are keen to fund marine science and more research about, that can help us make informed, evidence-based decisions. Because we do definitely want to see more resilient marine protected area in the Seychelles. Exploring and finding out what lives beneath our ocean is vital so that we can conserve and manage the resources that, that we find in the depths of our ocean. Because without understanding what lives there, how are we supposed to conserve it?